I'm delighted to welcome uh, Jean-Pierre Lacroix, who, uh, as you know, is the Under Secretary General at the United Nations for Peace Operations. Uh, I briefly overlapped with Jean-Pierre while I was still there myself, but I know that he has a very close relationship with uh, our Ambassador Geraldine mm -hmm. Byrne-Nason mm -hmm. and indeed generally with Ireland and uh, I've, I'm aware from my own background of the uh, very close cooperation we've had with the department which the Under Secretary General uh, heads at the UN. Um, Jean-Pierre Lacroix has had a very distinguished career uh, at the senior levels of diplomatic and political life in, in, in France. Um, at different times you've been Ambassador to Sweden, you've been Deputy Permanent Representative at the French Mission to the UN, uh, you've been Advisor in the Office of the Prime Minister, I know that, and you've been the Head of the Department at the Quai d'Orsay in charge of the UN and international organisations. So from that then you came to your present position uh, at the UN and really for the very few in this room who are not, not initiated, I suspect everybody knows, it's one of the critically important jobs uh, at, at the UN. Uh, I mean, all of us as ambassadors there could, could witness the impact which that job has. The number of challenges that you face is absolutely overwhelming, whether it is um, the, the, uh, the changing nature of the threats which have to be dealt with, uh, the degree of consensus that exists or does not exist on, mm -hmm. on, on UN interventions mm -hmm. in those situations, the budgetary challenge, uh, right. uh, which in the last couple of years I suspect has become uh, even more um, pressing than, than in the past. And then also the wider issue of integrating peacekeeping within the architecture of the UN and, and getting a better join-up with the um, the other pillars. Mm -hmm. It's a priority, I know, for the present mm -hmm. Secretary General. So, plenty to talk about, and as usual at the IIA, um, there is a, a practice of the speaker's remarks being on the record, and uh, after that the Q&A would be Chapman House Rules. I think there's probably nobody in this room who doesn't know Chapman House Rules. Um, and uh, so with that, Jean-Pierre, I give you the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you for having me. And, uh, and also, I would like to start by saying how uh, happy I am to be here in Ireland, uh, because I, I, I don't want to sort of uh, be overly diplomatic, but uh, uh, sincerely uh, uh, and, and you know, in all honesty, uh, Ireland is a, is a very solid, true, reliable, uh, partner uh, for the UN in general. The commitment to multilateralism uh, is uh, something that uh, certainly we can use uh, these days, uh, but also and more specifically Ireland's commitment to, to peacekeeping. So I feel here that I'm uh, speaking uh, to, to an audience and, and to uh, uh, colleagues who are very well informed and, and, and versed in, uh, you know, into the uh, the, the, the reality of peacekeeping and also the challenges that we're currently uh, facing and, uh, and I will address uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the challenges that mm. we're facing and, and because we're trying to 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 find adequate responses to these challenges but um, uh, let me just say, start by saying that uh, um, it, it's important to uh, first of all to, to to remember the uh, and recall the uh, the achievements of uh, the UN when it comes to peacekeeping, and it's not only about the past and a number of uh, countries that were helped by peacekeeping operation in their uh, you know return to uh, stability, uh, and the list is very long of these countries. But it's also about uh, the current achievements uh, in terms of protection of civilians. Uh, we have now. Uh, protection of civilian as a uh, key priorities in many of our missions, particularly in Africa, and I think we uh, protect uh, every single day hundreds of thousands of people in different ways, uh, uh, and sometimes really making the difference between life and death. Of course, we would like to do more, and sometimes we don't uh, do what we would want to do, but still the protection of civilian is, I think, uh, an achievement uh, of peacekeeping. And then the other achievement, which is also happening every day and uh, uh, not always very much on the radar screen is the preventative role of peacekeeping and here 
Um, I have very much in mind uh, what we call the traditional peacekeeping operation. In other words, uh, mostly military people mm -hmm. somehow along a ceasefire line or in a, uh, you know, essentially tasked with uh, uh, monitoring a ceasefire and preventing any incident from escalating. And this is something uh, that UNIFIL uh, does on a, uh, on a daily basis. This is something that uh, colleagues on, uh, in Cyprus do. And, uh, and I think it's important to highlight this because it's uh, prevention uh, is uh, what it is. When nothing happens, then uh, no one has anything to talk about. But uh, uh, we know, and you know, and because you, you have uh, soldiers and staff in uh, southern Lebanon and uh, also on, on the Golan, and um, uh, there are incidents occur every every week and sometimes every day and uh, and they might be very small but uh, if uh, the the blue helmets are not there to quickly de-escalate then uh, those incidents could very easily uh, turn into a situation that would be out of control and, uh, and 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 we never forget that we are dealing with parties that do not talk to each other and they don't recognize each other they don't want to talk to each other there's an exception in uh, southern Lebanon because we facilitate some form of liaison with uh, between the uh, Lebanese armed forces and the uh, IDF but still so the preventative role the protection of civilian and the fact that uh, in, in many countries have been helped by peacekeeping um, but at the same time we we have uh, today challenges that are Maybe some not not totally new, and uh, but the, the, their magnitude is is significant, and also they uh, have uh, evolved in their nature because the the nature of a, the conflicts we're dealing with has also evolved, and I think um, uh, those challenges are essentially four. One is uh, the fact that the the political processes that we are supporting are usually moving very slowly or not moving at all, and. Um, and this is a problem for us because uh, I think it's quite clear that whatever the mandate, peace operations are there to support a political solution. That, that's really their key purpose. But if those political efforts are not succeeding, if they're moving too slowly or not at all, then uh, we don't have a prospect for exit. And uh, there's a sentiment that then settles that we were there forever, we are stuck. And then there's an additional sentiment that sort of settles as well, or which is you're failing. I mean, you, you've been in Cyprus for 40 years or 50 years, and uh, we don't have politi political solution there. How come? You know, um, so number one channel. Of course, there, <laughs> there are explanations to that, and, but, but uh, um, uh, I see uh, this as a, as, as a major challenge, especially at a time where the international community is divided and we mm -hmm. cannot rely on a united... Uh, Security Council on a united uh, international community, which would be in a better position to support political efforts. Now, the second challenge is the uh, the, the, the question of uh, the how dangerous or how much more dangerous the environment in which peace operation uh, operate uh, is are today. Uh, We've had higher number of fatalities in peacekeeping as a result of uh, attacks against the uh, blue helmets, uh, but also against the humanitarian worker. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, today or tonight, we had uh, three uh, colleagues from WHO who were killed in the eastern Congo uh, because of the uh, uh, situation there and uh, and uh, the, the, the tensions that arose uh, as a result of uh, uh, a number of factors, but the, the reality is that the blue flag or the blue helmet does, uh, do not protect anymore, and in some cases, unfortunately, they make you a target. Mm. Um, and uh, that is something to which we have to uh, adapt, and that it's very much as a result of uh, the evolving nature of conflict, the fact that we're having to deal more and more with armed groups. Um, criminal groups or terrorist group or, or combination thereof and uh, those groups and those people have no interest in peace at all and they have uh, th in many cases they don't have much by way of political agenda so how yeah. do you 
interact with them and for what. And, and so that's the second uh, challenge. The third challenge is the uh, high number of vulnerable civilians uh, in many of our peace uh, operation settings and uh, that makes protection of civilian a very key priorities of our, of our mandates and particularly in the big missions in Africa. And then against this backdrop we have uh, issues that have to do with preparedness and, and I think part of it comes with the need to adjust from a traditional uh, quote-unquote again uh, more kind of uh, peaceful or maybe less challenging type of peacekeeping, although I again believe that uh, even those traditional missions are challenging and, uh, and sometimes dangerous, uh, but it also comes from the fact that uh, we have uh, um, issues that have to do with training, equipment, uh, um, performance assessment is something that we are working on as well, mindset, uh, again mindset partly comes from this transition to a different kind of peacekeeping, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the problem with capacity and preparedness. So th this is the uh, sort of uh, the, ter the, determination that the determination that we made when, when the uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres started his, uh, in uh, uh, his position in 2017. And uh, the, the, the choice was made to share very candidly those challenges with mm -hmm. member states and explain to them that we would be working on, on, on them and we would take action and, and remedial all actions in, uh, in many different areas. But at the same time, the key message was that uh, we needed to work with them and um, we needed the member states to help us because peacekeeping is uh, quintessentially a partnership between member states and uh, ourselves. Um, because our member states provide us with our mandates, our resources, financial resources, troop and police, uh, and uh, we uh, and they can be also instrumental in helping us uh, um, remedy uh, the different issues and problems we have in in in, in many different areas, uh, training equipment and all this. So um, th that was the, uh, the, the, the approach that guided the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative, which is the sort of strategic framework uh, against which we have taken a number of uh, actions. Um, and the, and the, the, the political momentum we, we, we got was when we uh, shared a, a declaration of shared commitment with the member states and we, we invited them to sign on. Of course, we had a few discussions with, with them to make sure that we would have as many <coughs> signatory, signatories as possible. Uh, and we had many, 152 member states, which I think also <coughs> was reflective of the fact that peacekeeping still benefits from a relatively high degree of support in the UN. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, as an activity, as a UN activity, uh, so at least this is something on which we can build on and provide it that we are seen as taking action and, and, and being reactive in, in, in the face of all these challenges, I think we can <coughs> sustain this support. Uh, within the peace, uh, the Action for Peacekeeping initiative, uh, we uh, have essentially five or six key areas within which we, we work and uh, we, we've taking a number of action. Uh, the, 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 the first priority area is the political dimension. It, it is the most elusive and, and it is uh, the, the subject on which uh, it will be more difficult to come up with uh, trends and numbers and, and diagrams and uh, that uh, would sort of um, <coughs> somehow suggest uh, impact or improvement. But at the same time, we want to make that uh, as, a, as a top priority and a top item on our list because we, uh, as I said, I mean, we're about supporting political solutions, but member states need to hear that message that they need to help us and they need to uh, use <coughs> and, and dedicate their energy and their influence uh, to support uh, in different ways those political efforts because we, we need them, we need the parties to, to be willing, uh, the parties need to, need to be encouraged and pressured uh, if needed by uh, those who can uh, have an influence. We, we also need to work with uh, regional, sub-regional organizations such as the African Union or any other, the EU of course. Uh, 
So that was the first uh, uh, item, and the message was uh, work with us, uh, and, and please uh, uh, try to, to help unlock some of these stalled political processes. The second item is uh, what I call the performance cluster. It's uh, everything we need to do to uh, improve performance. And uh, we launched a number of initiatives regarding the improvement of training, both in terms of the scope of training, but also the, the way in which training was provided with uh, a couple of areas which we're putting the emphasis, such as leadership training uh, and uh, uh, the um, in-mission training teams uh, to make sure that uh, uh, there will be uh, refreshment and uh, uh, also that our team, particularly the leaders, will be, uh, will be getting this additional training when deployed. Um, we uh, have been also taking a number of initiatives, and, and by the way, uh, 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 this is something that we, we, we need to fund on, voluntary, on the basis of voluntary funding. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, peacekeeping is finance through assessed contribution, there's a scale of assessment uh, by which you know, member states pay a certain percentage of the total budget of uh, peace operation, but uh, we do not, we cannot fund some of the key activities like training uh, uh, or um, evaluation and many other um, areas uh, with, these, uh, with, with these peacekeeping budgets. So we, we call on, we, we, we rely on voluntary funding and that is true for uh, the training plan that we launched and that is true for many of the other initiatives that we took uh, to improve uh, equipment gaps and to improve the preparedness. We, we, we had a discovered that uh, the, some of the units that were deployed uh, were not evaluated enough in terms of their ability not only to be good peacekeepers but also in, their, in terms of their uh, core ability to basically perform as a military or police unit and we've developed uh, enhanced pre-deployment visits. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, 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 of new instrument that we have as well to assess uh, performance of uh, military units, police unit, and performance of mission as a whole. That is called the comprehensive police uh, comprehensive uh, performance assessment system. And uh, th these are tools, of course, but uh, we, we 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 thought that we needed to have to 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 be a bit more scientific when it comes to assessing what uh, our different components uh, do on the ground, how they perform, uh, even though we recognize that ultimately performance is also has a, has a non sort of, uh, uh, you know, l less mathematical uh, uh, aspect as well. Um, we have been working a lot on um, medical support as well. Accountability, the, this is something that now we sort of systematically evaluate, when, especially when we have incidents where we think we've been failing, particularly in protecting civilians, and we systematically investigate. And, and I think that there's a recognition uh, with our troop and police contributing countries that we, we, do, the, we do this in a constructive spirit. We, we, we are very candid with, uh, with them, but we also recognize that uh, in most cases we, there, there are also some problems and issues that have to do with our own organization and not only with the PCCs and PCC, which is, you know, our, uh, the, the, that's how we call them, our troop and police contributing countries. Um, but we've had many cases where uh, by this, through this very sort of candid interaction with them, uh, we've been able to talk about issues and, and remedy uh, and, and see improvement, which I think is uh, really the way forward. So that's the performance cluster, and there, there are many other aspects. One of them is the, to, to which Ireland has contributed a lot, is the rolling out of a peace inter, uh, peacekeeping intelligence policy, uh, which is critical because we need to have also a better situation awareness and better capacity to uh, be aware of what goes on in the environment in which we operate and then be in a better position to, to preempt and prevent threats to us and to the population. The third aspect on which we're working a lot is uh, the having more women in peacekeeping and also involving women more in political processes. These are the two branches of what uh, we call the uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And you uh, all know that 
there was a landmark resolution adopted by the Security Council 19 years ago, so next That's year will be 20 ago. years ago, uh, sort of really launching this uh, very important platform. Um, the, uh, having more women in peacekeeping, we see it as a, as a not really, it, it's about performance. And, and it's not only about uh, improving the work environment and making sure that we have a work environment in our peace operation that is more reflective of the diversity of the uh, so societies, the communities in which we uh, were active, but uh, it is also very important uh, because we, we're interacting a lot with communities in, in peacekeeping and southern Lebanon uh, uh, is a case in point. We, we, we are quite many in that relatively small area uh, and sometimes we're quite intrusive. Um, so, and, and this is a very populated area, so we have to uh, build trust with the population. We have to make sure that they would accept us and we have to make sure they would understand what we do and why we're there. And uh, the challenges are the same, they're probably even uh, greater to a certain extent uh, in some of our missions in Africa because there we're talking about communities that are sometimes extremely traumatized and vulnerable because of the activities of armed groups and mm -hmm. uh, gender-based violence and uh, uh, atrocities really committed ag against those communities. And, and if we are to uh, build trust and, and uh, enable ourselves to, to be effective, then uh, we have to uh, have women with us interacting with communities, otherwise, uh, uh, if we if we come only with men uh, in uniform and with weapon to groups that are uh, traumatized and have been harassed by men uh, with weapon, maybe not necessarily with uniform, then mm -hmm. we we know we won't build the kind of trust that we need, and that will also be uh, uh, a disadvantage when it comes to having a better situation awareness. Not to mention the role that we're trying to play regarding uh, gender-based violence and other type of atrocities against either women or children. So I think we're in a better position now because there's a total awareness, I think, within member states and proven police contributing country that we need to have more women and they themselves uh, are increasing the, the number of women in their own national and police force. But uh, it, it's still a work in progress. We've uh, almost doubled the proportion of staff officers and military observers and police officers or individual police officers over the last two years, it's, uh, but it's still low. It uh, went from seven or eight percent to roughly 15 percent. Uh, the form unit, uh, it's uh, lower, but it is also on the upward trend. Uh, and I think we've jumped to almost one percent from uh, in one year, with from 4.1 to 4.1 to 5 percent. So that's not a lot, but uh, one percent mm -hmm. is. Uh, uh, significant in our, uh, yeah. because we have 70,000 military and 10,000 police deployed, so 1% of 70,000 is already something and can make a difference on the ground. And we've recently appointed uh, uh, a Brigadier General from uh, Ireland, as you may know, uh, General Maureen O'Brien, mm -hmm. uh, who's currently the Acting uh, Force Commander in uh, UNDOF. Uh, and, and we're I think about to appoint another female general to, to another position. We have a head of uh, the uh, UNFISIP uh, force, uh, who is also a, a major general from Australia. So we're getting there slowly and uh, even on the, on the top ranks. Uh, and then the second part, equally important, is how to involve women more in political efforts and political processes, which is, uh, I think, a condition f to make peace agreements and peace more uh, sustainable and, and more accepted. In other words, make sure that there would be a peace, not only on paper, but one that would be accepted and, uh, uh, and, and that would be uh, really, that would take hold in, in, in hearts and minds and, uh, and be rooted in communities. So this is also something that uh, is, uh, th there, there is some progress, and particularly when we look at some of the provisions that you can see now in some of the peace agreements or some of the new constitution of uh, conflict emerging from of countries emerging from crisis. Uh, but I think it's still uh, not really something that is accepted and totally and mainstream. And uh, in the involvement of women is, uh, uh, to me, still is uh, okay, uh, not systematic and. Uh, 
tends to be a bit uh, too much uh, you know, one shot uh, here and there, but not something that is sustained throughout a political process. Maybe a bit more on at the local level, because we do handle a lot of uh, small local conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and there, I think uh, our peacekeepers uh, do a lot in terms of involving women. Um, so uh, a few other issues, and very briefly, first of all, Everything that I mentioned here, political efforts, performance, women in, in peacekeeping, uh, is about partnership because we cannot work on performance without partners, uh, not only the troop and police contributing countries, but also those who can help. And I know Ireland does training mm -hmm. with other troop uh, awesome. and police contributing country. Um, the, the, we also have partnership that we're trying to develop uh, in order to fill some equipment gaps and we've recently had a few examples where uh, one country came to the support of another one deployed in the field to, to mitigate those equipment gaps. Of course, partnership are absolutely critical when it comes to political efforts. Uh, one example is how we work together with the African Union to bring about a peace agreement in the Central African Republic, which we know we wouldn't have been able to do that uh, if we had been working alone or if the African Union had been working alone. And then the third dimension of partnership is on the ground because we, uh, we need to have prioritized mandate. And I think one thing that we hear a lot, and you certainly remember that, mm -hmm. prioritized mandate for peacekeeping, which I think is perfectly right. But then prioritized mandates, which I think should be about peace efforts, protection of civilian capacity building. That, that's really what we're, where we should focus on. But then it means that others should do other things or should help us do what uh, uh, we do uh, on these three areas. And, uh, and we see that we're working much more and we will be working more with partners on the ground, uh, with the EU ETMs, the EU training mission that we have uh, and uh, Ireland is involved in, uh, uh, in, in those uh, missions in, in Mali or Central African Republic. There's one in, in Somalia as well. Um, and, you know, the World Bank uh, agency funds and programs and all of this. Um, and we, we, I think uh, the challenge is to make sure that uh, we really bring where the uh, input in the areas where we have the biggest added value and mm. we also uh, um, coordinate us in such a way as uh, to avoid duplication and to really maximize our uh, respective input. <coughs> uh, the reforms uh, that were carried out, uh, mm, you know, at the initiative of the Secretary General, then accepted, uh, adopted by member states, uh, really uh, aim at providing and promoting this more integrated way of working. And I think. Uh, by bringing closer together the Department of Peace Operation, the Department of Political Affairs, uh, by promoting a more integrated way of working with the agency funds and program. Um, there is, I think, a new spirit. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, all these different UN well. institutions have their own ways of working, their own tradition, mobility. We're talking about mobility. It's very weak and so on and so forth, but I do think that we have some progress there. Um, and, and uh, we've been working on s uh, a few uh, situations where we are currently <coughs> transiting or transitioning from peacekeeping to another form of international support. In Haiti, that was the case. In Darfur, it is currently the case. So this also helps us sort of approach situation from uh, the right angle, which has to be uh, a broad one. Uh, and I keep insisting that uh, uh, in any situation in which we are deployed as peace operation, we should not look at that situation from the point of view or the angle of the peace operation. We should look at the situation mm -hmm. from the point of view of what is it that we can and should do to make a difference. And then what is our role as peace operation and what is the other's role that should uh, complement uh, our own activities in peacekeeping. So finally, just a word on improving conduct and discipline as well, which has been a major issue. Not that the, 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 uh, the, the situation regarding sexual exploitation abuse was, was not more prevalent in peacekeeping than in any other branch of the United Nations system, but it was certainly even more unacceptable. So uh, there was a lot that was done uh, and very much because of the 
uh, personal engagement of the Secretary General. I think we're in a better place now. We have a much stronger reactivity by a member state. I think we also uh, are more effective in learning about the allegation, making sure that they're, come, they're brought to our knowledge. Um, and I think we're also better in terms of supporting victims because we have now this new system with um, uh, victims' rights advocate in our big mission and uh, we provide all kind of support to, to victims including when it comes to paternity claim. Um, but I think, the, and the number of allegations is decreasing peacekeeping, so that is a good sign. On the other hand, I think we're not off the hook. I think that, uh, uh, first of all, there are still cases, uh, there are allegations Many of these allegations are about all cases, but still we have to deal with these cases. And I, I see an issue in terms of the responsiveness of a few states regarding all cases. I see a problem when it comes to making sure that all states will have the proper legislation to prosecute those responsible for these acts. And I see a problem in terms of making sure that we uh, really all allegations will be brought to our knowledge. And I think it's, uh, again, we're improving there, but I think it's a work in progress. So uh, just uh, to wrap up, um, I think the future of partnership will be very much about, par uh, uh, the, you see, the future of peace operation will be very much about partnership. I think uh, that's quite clear in all aspects. Um, and um, we, we have this big operation today. We're very much focusing on trying to improve the impact of these operations that are all challenged and operating in challenging environment and at the same time we have to think of the way forward <clears throat> and I believe that there will be a further diversification of the ways and modalities in which the UN will uh, act on the ground be deployed to to, to promote peace because I uh, it, it is clear that peacekeeping uh, can be a flexible instrument but it's not eff effective and it's not appropriate and adequate for any kind of situation and particularly when we talk about peace enforcement, uh, counter-terrorism, then peacekeeping is not the response. So we have to then work to support other form of operation. This is why we're very supportive of uh, strengthening the uh, African Union capacity for their own operation and supporting initiatives such as the G5 Sahel. Uh, I think this is a way forward. This is not... Uh, uh, it, it is complementary to what peacekeeping and even robust peacekeeping can do, but I think there has to be a line. It's made probably a, a blurred line, but I think there has to be a line drawn uh, between those different type of situations, the, the kind of responses that they call for. And with this, I thank you for your attention. <coughs>